Hello all. Thank you for joining us for the final webinar of Detecting and Defending Against Cyber Threats, a short course presented by IT Masters on behalf of Charles Sturt University. My name's Guy Coward and I'll MC this webinar and your mentor is still George Thomas, who as usual I'll ask you to welcome shortly. Before we begin, just the usual housekeeping, we encourage the questions and the use of chat during we our webinars. Uh, for those of you that are just coming, uh, we ask that you direct all questions relevant to course content uh, to the Q&A section and the send all administration type questions, dates, times, resource availability, and so on to the support team in chat. You can chat with panelists only or to your fellow students as well. And you can make that choice by toggling through the drop down box once you've opened the chat log. We'll have a Q&A session at the end of the webinar, um, the very end of the webinar, and this week we'll um, go over the, the course exam and sort of what the next steps are for all sorts of people and people who want all sorts of things. Uh, if a question is particularly relevant um, during George's discussion, then I'll jump in and, and put it to him straight away. As usual, Hannah and Rebecca are here in support for IT Masters, so thank you as usual. Hannah is also responsible for the course page, which is where you'll find the other materials needed for this course, stuff like the exam, which we'll talk about later. Uh, as I said, the forums are looking really good. Um, there's really interesting threads in there. So go have a look if you haven't already. Um, uh, and yeah, just basically that's about it. We're going to have a nice time today and um, cover off on the exam at the end. Um, please welcome back for the last time, George Thomas. Thanks, Guy. Uh, hopefully you can hear me. Um, yep. I am going to turn my video on. Uh, as I, I, Just before we started, I said that I made sure that it was going to work, except I think someone has to let me do it. Um, Guy? <laughs> Sorry? I'm, I'm blocked from sharing video. Ah, uh, righty. i got to make you host, don't I? Security. Yes. Yes, I, I was... I was um, taken with some comments in the chat about me having a head for radio. <laughs> I couldn't agree more. <laughs> well put. I've, I've definitely got hair for radio right now. <laughs> well, let's find out, George. Here's the great big reveal. Hey, there we go. Look at that. <laughs> oh, look at him. He's beautiful. Uh, yeah, it works. Uh, so anyway, so thanks everyone for, um, I guess, making it to week four. Uh, hopefully the, uh, the course has been useful so far. Um, and this week, I guess, uh, as the sort of outline discussed, um, it's going to be a bit of a next slide, quick recap, and then talking about the future. Um, and I, I, that's a pretty broad statement there, the future, but I'm talking about the, the future of, I guess, cyber and they, the, those sort of defense um, and detection strategies. Uh, and so the recap, I will keep uh, as short as I can. Um, obviously you can go back through the previous weeks and have a look at the slides from previous weeks and, and watch the recordings. Um, but I'll cover those off just sort of quickly. Um, and then we'll kind of talk a little bit about, I guess, what, where I think things are going. Um, and from obviously my own research, talking to peers, you know, th those sorts of things and just general observations. Um, so once again, <laughs> kind of going back to week one here, but common threats. I think what I wanted to kind of get across was that, um, you know, at the moment, the, the key threats um, that, that I'm seeing, uh, and sorry if I sound a little bit repetitive, but are the, the sort of business email compromise, uh, you know, the, the, the whole, um, you know, threat actor doing a, a, a sort of phishing campaign and or guessing a password and then being able to get in to a mailbox and effectively um, impersonate that user and then either continue that campaign or commit some sort of fraud. Um, the, the sort of ransomware type campaign, campaign where you know a system is broken into, um, which is you know very almost a traditional sort of attack, but then that additional step of encrypting um, information and then holding it to ransom um, takes place. Um, and now more recently, exfiltration being a part of that where data is effectively stolen and also held to ransom, which we've seen in the case of a number of organizations. Um, and then, you know, basically being, um, 
you know, told that in order to not have that information leaked, um, a ransom must be paid. And in order to get, to get information that has been encrypted back, a ransom must be paid. And, and, and this, this sort of skyrocketing um, threat actor fees that, are, that have kind of, um, you know, happened o over the past sort of 18 months where it used to be, you know, maybe a thousand dollars um, and now we're, you know, we're in the tens and, and even in, you know, tens or hundreds or, or millions of dollars for, for a ransom. And, and then finally, that, that sort of um, fraudulent transaction. Um, I, I did see that someone commented about the term wire fraud um, in, uh, in, in one of the forums. And, and I think I commented saying it might be a bit of leftovers from the time I spent in the US. Um, and I was trying to find a better term. So maybe someone could pop one in the, in the chat. Um, the ACEC actually call it wire fraud as well, but uh, I do agree that it, it does sound very Americanized. Um, anyway, so this is around, you know, fraudulent money transfers where effectively, and usually part of some sort of potential sort of spear phishing campaign where, um, and usually on the back of business email compromise where, um, you know, the, the CFO, CEO may instruct the CFO or you know the CEO may instruct the accounts department to make a fraudulent payment, and I've seen many instances of that with you know potential or with payments of uh, I think the biggest I saw, as I mentioned before, was uh, three point two million. Um, so th those are the the current um, common threats that I see, and that's sort of been the focus of this subject is around defending against some of those threats, um, and then you know detecting some of the the um, the, the indicators that a compromises occur that may contribute towards um, the success of these types of threats. Um, and then if we, we, we then went to those sort of defense strategies, which was week two, um, you know, I talked about governance. So this was around things like ISO 27001 uh, frameworks like the NIST cybersecurity framework, um, NIST 853, uh, some of the ASD or the ACSC, um, frameworks, and then a sort of discussion around technical controls. And I, I think where we sort of started there was around those traditional controls, like you know firewalls and antivirus and 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 um, you know I guess encryption and those sorts of things. And then sort of shifting into you know where it's going um, and, and what we're seeing now with the uh, quote uh, next gen type technologies, where things like machine learning. Um, are starting to be um, adopted and, and integrated into some of those more traditional platforms. Um, then we had a sort of discussion about audit and compliance, um, obviously a very riveting topic right there, making sure that you know, controls are in place and that compliance with governance and policies and those sorts of things. And then finally, sort of summarizing that as like this sort of active and passive defense and, you know, passive defense being those sort of, you know, traditional controls. Um, I probably should put that diagram back in and then active being, um, you know, a defense strategy that requires more full-time personnel, almost that eyes on glass. So, you know, you're like your sort of uh, security operations center, MSSPs, you know, the use of things like SEAM um, to, um, you know, de to actively defend against, against threats. Um, and then finally, we got into detection, which was last week, and we talked about some of those detective controls. We had um, uh, Matt from uh, from Splunk come in and, and help do a bit of a, a demo, which kind of backed on to what we looked at the week before with a, those sort of um, attack scenarios. Um, and I, I guess what I wanted to get in here was highlighting the importance of um, you know, logging and being able to, uh, I guess, collect, aggregate and um, have logs available. Generally, I guess my, my whole theory is around um, being able to identify you know, indicators of compromise and being able to detect intrusions and then have the forensic capabilities or forensic evidence to then um, you know, respond to that and identify what's happened and then prevent um, you know, further damage. Um, and that kind of leads on to the threat hunting thing, which is the sort of basis or, or sort of the assumption that it's, uh, that, that an organization is already compromised and that what you're then doing is looking for indicators of compromise to see, you know, 
where a threat actor may have been uh, able to infiltrate the environment and where they've been able to you know, access information and whether they've created you know, backdoors or accounts and if they're you know, exfiltrating any sort of, of, of data. So that is a very, very, and I thought it was gonna be very quick. So that was a very quick recap of, um, I guess the last three weeks. Um, and I thought what I would do is, and I don't know if, we want to pause for a very quick second or whether I should just jump into where I, some sort of future topics. Um, I don't know what you think, Guy. No, let's get, let's get to it. We'll go, okay. we'll go along. Um, yeah, we can cover the rest off in, um, in Q and A session at the end. Cool. So in terms of the future, cause I know that all that was, I mean, like, yeah, I've heard this in the last three weeks. So I thought let's talk about moving forward. Um, and, I probably, I've sort of put together a few high level bullets on sort of things that I'm seeing. And, and I know that what you're about to see on this slide, you're probably sitting and thinking, well, yeah, some of that's kind of happening now. But I, I think the, the, the point I'm trying to make is that we're probably going to see an increase in a lot of these things. And one thing that sort of popped up and it was a discussion that I had with um, a, a peer was the concept of corporate blackmail. Um, and and the, 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 I guess what I'm getting at here is if we kind of backtrack to the ransomware discussion and talk about how, or, you know, think about how um, a threat actor gets in, they put a, you know, sort of crypto, crypto locking um, malware on a machine, they ransomware the machine, um, and then they ask for money to unlock it, then that was kind of the first thing, right? That's what happened 18 months ago. And then they evolved into, all right, let's steal some information. So we steal it and we say, hey, um, or we, as in the threat actor says, hey, um, if you don't want us to leak this information, then you need to pay a ransom, which is kind of going into that almost sort of blackmail type scenario. Um, and, you know, this is typically going to be something that's quite sensitive, like, you know, customer information, something that could end up with you know significant penalties with you know those increases in um you know privacy regulations and legislation and things like that um but i what i think is happening is organizations are doing two things they're starting to shift a lot of their technologies to the cloud that's one thing and the second thing is they're becoming better at defending at these sort of attacks and as a result it's it's going to be more effort to then go and you know ransomware something when they could just take the take the information and hold it to ransom full stop, um, and so I think that's where things are going to go. It's just going to be a case of almost a sort of smash and grab. Go in there, well, smash and grab with a pay me otherwise I'll you know release all your your um, crown jewels to the to, to the world. But um, that's sort of one of the areas where where things are probably going to go. Um, the next thing is an increase in offensive attacks. And we've already seen some government like nation states setting up teams that are effectively um, you know, cyber warriors. So instead of defending against adversaries, it's going to sort of change uh, a lot more to offensive um, operations where, uh, and obviously with some specific countries, um, you know, these things have been established for quite a while. Um, but the, 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 the rate of that and the, the number of, I guess, nation states that will be doing that um, and, and increasing their capabilities, I've, I think is going to be something that will, will happen. And this is something that we actually, you know, we talk a bit more about in the, um, in, in uh, IT 534, I always forget the number. Um, supply chain attacks, look, I, um, I came back to Australia in what, 2017 and I sort of, you know, through the, I was at a conference and I, I sort of put it out there that, you know, supply chain security um, and third party risk was really important. And people kind of looked at me like, what is he talking about? Um, that was something that, you know, had been really um, focused on in the US for, for several years. And, you know, I'm at this conference, people like, mm, I don't know about this. This sounds a bit, you know, nah, that don't think so. Anyway, fast forward to now and suddenly it's become really important. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of, I mean, I get hassles probably four or five times a day about platforms that can solve that problem for me. Um, and, you know, that's going to be something that I think is going to continue to grow. Um, you know, we're relying on a lot of outsourcing 
um, think about it. I mean, the thing I said before about moving to cloud, um, you know, the, that's one example, but as important is, you know, supply chain in terms of, you know, manufacturing and, you know, components. And, and I think we even saw one of the, um, probably won't name them, but one of the computer vendors uh, a few years back, you know, one of their um, manuf uh, suppliers, um, you know, put some sort of like malware um, uh, or adware or something or spyware, um, you know, into the devices that they were, were supplying. Um, and then they were going into, a, and I mean, this is a well-known brand, you know, going into the devices and then getting it distributed across the world. Um, Threats to critical, critical infrastructure, uh, another, um, you know, area that I, I think is going to um, sort of grow in terms of, um, you know, uh, I guess, attacks. Um, once again, something that we kind of discussed in the, in the full subject, um, talking about, um, you know, power, gas, water, those sorts of things, those things that are, that are, you know, that are critical to operation. But, you know, even think about thing, areas like, you know, banking and, and hospitals. Um, and I, we sort of start to venture into the almost sort of cyber terrorism um, space. But those, um, you know, those, those particular targets are, are obviously critical. Um, and, you know, there's, uh, and, and I guess, you know, many countries are putting in legislation and, and regulation around making sure that the, or trying to make sure that the security of those particular, um, you know, th th that, that infrastructure is secure. Um, IOT, um, this is a fun one. Um, was it Mirai? Was that the bot? Um, maybe someone knows. I think it was the Mirai bot. Um, a few years back, which was the the bot that was basically took over IoT devices like you know refrigerators and and so forth, and was basically uh, used them as bots for distributed denial of service attacks. Um, when you think about it, you know TVs, refrigerators, cars, um, light switches, um, you know all these things now can come with um, you know. I guess embedded tech and the ability to connect to the internet, um, which uh, makes sense that um, they will become, um, you know, uh, I, I guess will become uh, weapons um, uh, and, and obviously have vulnerabilities. And I know that a lot of manufacturers have started to, you know, change default passwords and lock things down. But you know, nonetheless, like all tech, there's going to be um, vulnerabilities that. That, that will appear um, very, very big, um, you know, set of, I guess, um, tools that a threat actor could use. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about IoT in a second when I want to talk about um, uh, sort of threat intel again, but it'll be fun. It will be. So um, automation. You know, as I said, uh, machine learning and AI is starting, or machine learning is now becoming part of a lot of um, platforms and products. Um, and I think there's there's that kind of evolution towards um, true artificial intelligence. Are we there yet? Um, well, unless someone else can say that we are, I, I don't quite think so. Um, but, um, you know, able to adapt and, um, and you know, have machines effectively respond is something that will become increasingly um, prevalent. And I know that you know, thinking about things like intrusion prevention systems, where you know it, it does detect that um, something's going on and something anomalous, and it, it prevents that transaction from happening. Um, you know, that's been in place for many, many years. But you know, I guess the next evolution of that is the ability to learn and to not just be based on a set of, um, you know, rules and, and and those sorts of things. And, we, and we're starting to see some, you know, product and platforms out there that have those capabilities. Um, you know, the ability to kind of learn what normal behaviour is from a from an organisation's user base, and when it sees something normal, is actually proactively, um, you know, block that traffic. Um, which, um, being that I work in a law firm, is a little bit frightening um, because, you know, we have a lot of lawyers that, you know, if there's a, a false positive, um, that could be a, a bit of a, 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 could cause a bit of havoc. Um, 
Anyway, um, you know, cryptographic applications, you know, the, the adoption of blockchain and, and um, things like that. Um, you know, I was talking to someone yesterday about blockchain and, and the sort of benefits that it has. And I'm not talking about cryptocurrency, I'm talking about the actual blockchain and its applications. Um, I think that even though, yes, it's around now, it's going to grow in adoption. Um, why? Uh, for those that are familiar with it, um, you know, immutable transactions. So, you, you know, um, so a big focus on integrity. So, you, you know, you can't go and delete something from the blockchain. It's always there. Um, it's traceable. Anything that you do, I guess, quote, delete, it's not really a delete, it's an update. Um, it can go back and it's fully auditable. Uh, you know, it's decentralized, which is, you know, fantastic um, in terms of not having like a sort of central body. You know, there's many benefits to it. Um, and then we, you know, we talk about, um, you know, sort of quantum computing. And I know that, you know, security researchers and we've been, people have been saying for years, oh, quantum computing, it's going to bust encryption and, you know, wow, that's bad. And, and yeah, that's bad. That, that, that is bad. But um, from what I could tell, that hasn't happened yet. Um, and I don't think anyone's successfully done that with any current standard. Having said that, I think it was Google um, have claimed that they've reached what they call it like quantum supremacy. Um, and even though they're still not able to, um, you know, break, um, you know, current encryption standards, the fact that that sort of leap has happened is now at the point where organizations like NIST, which, you know, we talked about the US National Institute of Standards and Technology are looking for those sort of uh, post quantum cryptographic standards that um, won't be able to be broken by um, you know, quantum computing technologies. Um, and then I guess finally on, on this one, um, increased regulation and compliance. So, you know, we've seen, um, uh, we've seen notifiable data breaches scheme amendment in Australia. Um, so the amendment to the Privacy Act where you, uh, organizations that, um, uh, that um, have a privacy breach um, have to report it to the Privacy Commissioner. Uh, we've seen in Europe, general data protection regulation, uh, which came in in 2018, 2018. Um, in Australia, we've always we've also seen uh, CPS two three four. So, for anyone that's in um, finance, um, which is the the APRA regulation around security, um, as I mentioned, around critical infrastructure. There's the um, Security of Critical Infrastructure Act of two thousand and eighteen. Um, but then, you know, other countries like Canada have PEPIDA for privacy and, and um, New York have the New York uh, DFS cybersecurity regulations. So, you know, it's happening. Um, another story, uh, when I came back from the US, I asked the question of, uh, I, won't, I won't name, but um, I, I asked somebody um, in, well, let's say government, <laughs> whether uh, Australia would take a more regulatory approach to cybersecurity. And at the time, and mind you, this is three years ago, um, the answer was, was no. Um, and that same person um, just earlier this year um, basically talked about how, you know, there's going to be an increase in regulation in cybersecurity. And I, said, and I pulled him aside and said, that's um, strange because three years ago, you know, it was a, a case of, no, this isn't going to happen. Um, and he had a very valid, valid point, which was, you know, back then we weren't ready for it, um, but now we are. And I'm like, okay, cool. Anyway, great news um, that, you know, it's becoming, I guess, something that's going to have a lot more guidance and requirement rather than just kind of relying, that, uh, relying on, um, you know, organizations to go, yeah, it'll be all right. Um, so, you know, there's definitely been a shift that I've seen in the last sort of three, three to four years in Australia in terms of, um, you know, cyber security and, and the sort of focus on, you know, protecting, um, protecting organisations and institutions. So, I should breathe. Um, Remember to breathe, everybody. I know. <laughs> so, um, Let's talk about a couple of other things. Now I talked about active defense and I'm, I'm, I'm gonna talk about a few of these active activity things here. So active defense, threat hunting. Um, and I think the key thing I'm trying to point out here with the additional bullets is um, threat intelligence. And my view is that everyone should be 
doing threat intel um, on their own organizations, providing that's your job, right? <laughs> um, and I mean, look, the, the threat actors do. I mean, this is what they do when they want to target a particular organization. They gather intel and they try and work. Well, apart from the opportunistic threat actors, but generally if someone wants to attack a specific organization institution, they're going to gather intelligence. And so I've just listed, and there's more than this, there's like heaps of them. Um, I've just listed some sort of, you know, threat intel tools. And I'm gonna walk through them and then maybe we could have a quick look at them. Um, so um, OSINT, Open Source Intelligence. Um, and funnily enough, I, I, put, I put Google up the top um, for no apparent reason, maybe it's gonna say it alphabetical, no, D, D's down the bottom. Um, but you know, tools even like Google are, are really good sources for gathering, gathering intel. Um, and as I said, if you know what your threat actors uh, and you know what your adversaries are looking at, um, then you're in a really kind of better position to know what things you have to plug up and deal with. That's my view. Um, and coming from a, a background, obviously, where I was you know, very technical and then shifting into an offensive um, security role uh, and then moving into an in-house more you know, management defensive role. Um, it's good to have that perspective of, um, you know, uh, where am I vulnerable? Um, and to understand that. And so, you know, Google is great. Um, I believe the term is, is called Google dorking. Yep. Um, but basically using Google to gather Intel and I'll do a quick one of an example of that shortly. Um, other tools, Multego, um, you know, that's a, a tool that's used to, uh, I don't know if many of you are familiar with these tools. If you are, great. If you're not, um, you know, these are the ones that I tend to play with a little bit. Um, you know, Multego is good for, once again, identifying, um, you know, information around specific targets, whether it be an organization, a person, and so forth. And we'll, we'll have a quick, uh, quick look at that. Um, Shodan, that's, that's always good fun. Um, so it's a, a search engine, um, but it's not the kind of search engine that you think it is. It, it's, um, once again, for those that haven't used it or not aware of it, Shodan is used to search for devices connected to the internet. So IoT devices, routers, firewalls, webcams, SCADA systems, um, all those sorts of things. Um, and then, you know, you've got the, the, the dark web and the, the deep web um, and, and the information that you know, is contained um, in there. Um, I am not going to do a dark web tour today. And I was explaining to someone um, yesterday why that was a, why that, why that's a bad idea. Um, I, I did one for a small group at one point and let's just say sometimes the results that come up are very unexpected. Um, so, um, <laughs> intriguing. <laughs> yeah. Um, it was, uh, well, it wasn't like really bad. It was just like, um, well, yeah, uh, I basically kind of got a bit of a fright um, and uh, it was a little bit embarrassing, but um, yeah, <laughs> it, it's one of those things where I'm not going to risk it. Um, so yeah, so it, it, even something as simple as like an Nmap scan, right, is going to be, from, you know, is going to be useful um, for, for, for gathering intel. Some screenshots. So um, I'm going to go beyond this, but just so we kind of know, this, this is, just in case the demo guides don't have my back today and something bad happens. Um, not bad from what I said before, but like something doesn't work. Um, so, you know, tools like there's Multego in the middle there. Um, can you see the cursor? Anyway, the one that you got, okay, you've got Torbot on the left. Um, should be able to use that. Um, to the right of that, you've got Multego. Up the top there, Shodan, and then down the bottom, that's just a Talos screen, which, you know, if you actually click on those little bubbles, you can kind of see. Um, you know, particular addresses and reputations and things like that. Anyway, let's move forward. <laughs> There's my red warning again. Um, so this is a demo. This is a very passive demo. I'm not going to be breaking into anything um, or anything like that. Um, this is really more of a bit of a show and tell. I guess the only thing that I will say is um, just be aware of any applicable laws um, when you use any of these tools. Um, so, and, and I'm actually going to show you, I guess, how you can footprint something that's within your own environment. Um, but obviously, 
the tool is the tool and it can be used for anything. So just be aware that you're not breaking any laws when you do do that. So, um, all right. Can we, can we see my Google there? Yep. Cool. So this is an easy one. Let's start with dorking. Uh, does anyone, how do I ask questions? I mean, are people familiar with, anyone, anyone tried this? Um, basically, how many, I mean, if I ask the question, how many people have used Google, I, I think that, how many people got on the call? Uh, how many of you? I, I reckon 390 people are going to go yes. So, um, and, and most of the time, you know, people search for, you know, something, you know, like um, cats, right? So that's cool. Cats. <laughs> Great. Exclusively cats. Yeah. yeah. Ooh, that's, that's a pretty gruesome one there. Um, anyway, so what you can do is you can actually, and a lot of people don't know this, you, you can change the search queries to look for specific things. So if I want to like, you know, find specific, I don't know, PDFs on cats, um, I could do this, right? So if I'll type PDF and now you could see that these are all PDFs about cats. Cool. Probably not that exciting, except if you really like cats, then maybe that is exciting. Mm -hmm. um, but there are other things that you could do in, for example, you can look for specific things. So, I mean, anyone familiar with WordPress? Um, uh, where is my cursor? So what you could do is slash, is that right? Looks right is you can look for people that have their WordPress uploads publicly available, which is usually not good. And you could do direct rebrowsing here. So index of means that it will search for something that has a search for a site that has index of, which means it's a browsable directory uh, for WP content, which is WordPress. So this is not ideal. So this means that, um, and I'm not going to click on any of these, but if you did click on any of these, um, you could actually browse through their upload files. Um, so once again, what I would do in this instance, I'm pretty sure this is, you know, you obviously would point it at a particular site to say, okay, look, now that's one of my sites and obviously I don't have it enabled, so nothing's come up, which is why I didn't do that in the first place. Otherwise it would be far less exciting to see we found nothing. But, um, you know, a, a good example is just doing a check like that and you could see, hey, like, um, wow, I've got that enabled that's bad I should probably turn that off um, you know likewise you can you can you know change some of these queries to look as I said look for specific file types look for specific keywords and those sorts of things so um, and you can use it to look for specific vulnerabilities so um, you know I know that a vulnerability scan will do that too like if you ran OpenVAS or um, some of the modules of Nmap you could bring up a vulnerability but in some instances like for example with um, you know, WordPress, you could look for a specific of word, version of WordPress that may be vulnerable simply by using, by doing a Google search. So that's an easy one. Um, cool. Now, where is my, talking about searching, um, bit of a change today, let's play with Carly Linux. So we, we, uh, we used Parrot the last few weeks um, there's also Kali Linux, so another distribution that contains a lot of security tools, pretty useful. Um, three gig, four gig download. Would you, um, would you use one over the other in particular situations? They have very, very similar um, um, sort of sets of tools. Um, I, I used to use Kali, and then I think one of the laptops I had, the display driver was wonky, and I couldn't be bothered fixing it, and Parrot just worked, so I just changed over. Um, but the bulk of the tools on there are almost the same. So, um, yeah, it's personal preference in my opinion anyway. So <laughs> Path of least resistance. Yeah, pretty much. So what we're going to do here is I'm going to have a quick look at um, Torbot. Um, so what Torbot is, is it's a crawler that can be used to search um, and index the dark web. Now, being a crawler, it works on the same principle, but it needs something and it finds links and it follows those links. Torbot can be used um, for both surface web, so your normal internet, as well as um, uh, Tor, so um, dark web sites. So let's uh, let, let's see if this works. I'm just going to quickly check that my 
tunnel is up because I don't want to be doing this unless my tour tunnel is up. Uh, okay, listen's good. Cool. All right. Um, ignore that. That's uh, that's just me making sure that, that my my tour um, connection is is running. Um, actually, is it? <laughs> Oops. Myself. Sometimes there's no one better. I've got used to it. <laughs> got some nice comments in the chat saying, oh, you show off. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it might not work. There we go. <laughs> Uh, stay anonymous. Uh, I don't know. Where is it? Congratulations. This browser is configured to use Tor. Perfect. Um, and for those that don't know, um, Tor, the Onion Router, um, basically it's a network that um, you know, peel back the layers but effectively you do multiple hops um, so that your traceability is more difficult. I'm not going to say impossible. Um, and half the time I end up popping out in the middle of the ocean. Um, I'm not sure that's about, uh, but it's also used to access sites on the dark web and you'll see some onion links in a minute. Um, anyway, so if I, uh, where am I? Let's have a look. So, blind what's going on here I feel like I am home oh oh there awesome. all right okay so cool all right I remember the syntax hmm. Or what ha dash you. All right, so let's just do this on a public website. I'll just do my own. Should work. Okay. So what it does is it's going to jump on my site. It's going to start looking for links and it's going to kind of follow them around and load the page titles and things like that. Really good idea. Better though sometimes than just kind of, you know, going there and you know potentially because obviously there's going to be illegal content <laughs> there and um you know if that's going to happen it's better not to be looking at it so um this does a search like that um and what we can do is let's find one that's actually got onion links on it uh, so you'll see Um, try again. Two hundred and ten links found. I like that donate. So you could. Oh, uh, so what it's trying to do is um, where it can. It tries to see if that link is actually live. Um, that one, I've, as you can see up there, it failed, so it's not. This should change in a second. We should see some. Um, there we go. There's an onion link in there. So anyway, this is what it's doing. Is it, it's loading. Um, whoa, I think I've been blacklisted. <laughs> anyway, how do you how do you tell that? Oh, because it's like the connections are boarded. It definitely wasn't doing that before. I don't know. Maybe it's all right. Um, so as you can see there, oh, like I said, hire a hacker. Uh, anyway, so as it kind of goes through, and then what you could do is you can, you know, use one of those links and you can hit those and then it'll propagate down into those and see what links out of there. And it basically lets you kind of, it's like a, a Google search for, um, you know, that you could target a specific thing. Um, and, um, and as I said, you can, one of the good uses for it is if you want to like index your own site, you could do that. Um, or if you want to, you know, see what's on a particular um, 
uh, you know, if you want to try and harvest some information to see if there's anything that might be pertinent to what um, to, to your organizations or, or yourselves, you could you could do things like that. And there's a lot more options um, in there. If I just do a HH help, just because it's a bit boring here, but H. Um, yeah, so, you know, there are things like, um, so you get email addresses from the crawled sites. So if you point that at a particular site and you want to see if your email address appears on there or something like that, um, you know, you, you could do things like that. What I actually do have, um, I might be able to start it up is there's the, you know, the, the download databases as well that have the, like, you know, all the lead credentials. So those things are available as well. And you've got websites like, um, you know, Troy Hunt, have I been, um, have I been pawned that, uh, you know, have ex you know, that have extracted that information and let you do a lookup to see you know if your account appears on there um, that information is does is floating around um, and it's definitely something that I've used before you know when specifically looking at an organization like you know is my organization's domain name are there users in here um, and also used for you know password audits um, of of the organization. So I guess my point is all this stuff, all this information is here, but making sure that you're using it for proper purposes is kind of the key thing, right? Because um, you can easily be misused. Um, anyway, I'm just going to jump back to Shodan. Um, I don't think I want to use Shodan. Uh, as I said, it's a tool that basically is another search engine. Um, now. So yeah, this has come up. What this is, is this is a webcam that is publicly facing on the internet. Um, and what you could do from Shodan is you can obviously connect to it. Um, and if there's no username and password, and you can usually tell because, for example, if I scroll down, there might be one that says like login or something. There, okay, so unauthorized. So when, when Shodan's hit that, it says unauthorized, which means that a username and password is probably required. This one here, pretty sure that username and password is not required because you've kind of got that preview. Um, but effectively it's used for being able to identify devices that are connected to the internet. So the question is, okay, this sounds a bit nefarious, but um, you can use this once again, and the, my intention here is to use this for testing uh, an organization's, I guess, publicly facing devices. And so you can use filters up in here to filter. So, so for example, if I went, you know, Cisco net colon and then put in, I don't know, xxx.xxx.xxx.xxx slash 24, right? And I did that, okay, well, the Xs won't work. But if I used my organization's subnet um, or, you know, I would then be able to return devices that are exposed to the internet and I could potentially identify if there were any that A, I didn't know about, that would be bad. Um, and B, if they weren't secured properly, which would also be bad. Um, and I do have an example of one I ran earlier um, on a subnet that I, and I did block it out. Hopefully I blocked it out in all the right places. Um, here, okay. So I um, I did the I did the scan um, of obviously an IP address range that I knew, and stuff came up. So and then I obviously redacted a lot of it, but you know this then kind of shows me um, not only what is exposed but what those devices may be. So I can see there there's like a WebEx server. Um, you know I can see that I think I might have blocked that off. There's like, you know, there's a SIP connection there. So that's other, some other sort of voice gateway. Uh, but, you know, really, really useful tool um, for, for doing that sort of thing. Um, definitely recommend doing that as part of, you know, a, a routine kind of audit. Um, all right. Uh, and the only other thing that I was going to do was, and I kind of jumped over it, whoops, was um, I'll take it. Let's see if I can get that to work. Maybe. So Multego, another good investigation tool, um, really useful for, I guess, connecting the dots. Um, give me a second. So there's a free community edition. Um, by the way, the paid edition is 
awesome, but it's not cheap. And if I forgot how to use this. Sorry, kind of blasting through it. I'm sure a lot of this we could probably um, cover off in a lot more detail. Good time. That's the beauty of the recorded webinars. Well, no, I still don't go into the detail. <laughs> I've really glazed over it, but um, good to know. Good to be aware of these tools. Um, and as I said, if they're used, you know, legitimately, um, they're really valuable. Uh, come on. Yeah. David's asked an interesting question. How do you know Shodan don't share the data of what they find? Well, they do. Oh, okay. There you go. <laughs> so they, they do. So that stuff's already um, like, it's a search engine, right? So it's already, it's already there. Um, anyone could type in that address range and the same results would come up. So I guess that's what kind of what I was getting at when I went, if I get back there, um, that was it. So like this is, um, you know, this is a, this is on a Deutsche Telekom um, connection. Um, I don't know who this is. This isn't, this is someone in Germany clearly. Um, so, you know, I, I guess that's the, the, the trick is that this is publicly available. So, um, and as I said, with this one, I know that if I click on that, I am likely to see whatever's on the other end of that camera. Um, very likely to see what's on the other end of that camera, which is not good. Um, in which case, you know, it just, sort of demonstrates that that is not appropriately secured. Um, so if that happens and you're searching your own subnet, um, anyone else can too. Um, to be honest, anyone else could just do an Nmap against your subnet and probably come up with the same conclusion. This just provides you a little bit more, a um, little bit more detail without having to, you know, do that Nmap. Um, sorry, where was I? Uh, right. So, I clicked it. Did it crash? It's always the last one where the demo guides go, you know what? No, no, not going to happen, mate. You're not going to get to the end. Um, so you get this privacy mode. Um, normal, which means, you know, it will retrieve things from the source and I don't care. Um, there's like a stealth mode, but yeah, I'm not doing anything dodgy. Um, because I'm going to do it on myself. So what I will do is go to machines and there's this concept of machines in, in Multigo where you basically run a machine and the machine goes and does something. Now, this is kind of cool, company stalker. Um, it will try and get all the email addresses at a specific domain. Now, I'm gonna tell you right now, you gotta pay for that. So let's just skip that. And let's footprint something. Oh, we're gonna be here all day. So level one footprint. Uh, domain name. I like for putting my own stuff because at least I'm not getting in trouble. Um, although I am behind a VPN. Anyway, finish. And let's let it do its thing. Sorry, it's a little bit tiny. Um, okay, there's my domain. Please do something else. We should get lines and stuff. So really good sort of footprinting tool. Um, come on. <laughs> the suspense. I know. Is it still going? Oh, okay. It's a bit frozen, which is usually a sign that it's still doing something. So mm -hmm. you can see here, it's attempted a zone transfer. Um, that won't work because my zone's locked. But if you've got a poorly configured DNS, it will transfer your zone and you can see all the DNS records in the zone. That's bad. Um, seriously? Come on. I'll like throw you a softball while we're waiting. Rohit has asked in the questions, how do you get your hands on a hoodie that Dr. Thomas is wearing? On a hoodie, sorry, that Dr. Thomas is wearing. Looks awesome. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, you just ordered one. That's a Charles Sturt. It Pretty is. Right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, t t tip for beginners, order a size down. Um, I did actually, I was like, Ooh, I think, uh, cause I saw, um, I don't know. Uh, I mean, some of you may be familiar with Oliver, um, um, at, at Charles Sturt, one of the professors there. And I saw him wear one and I was like, wow, that thing looks huge. 
And so I just went, mm, I'm going to get the size down. <laughs> and um, I'm glad I did, because if it was any bigger, um, I would have problems. <laughs> I think my fee, I don't know if it's still running or whether it's like chucked us back. Yeah. Normally you get lines and um, what, what, what normally pops up is I'll, I'll end up with like, you know, it'll, it'll show my, uh, like my MX records and my servers and my DNS servers and, you know, any associated information with this domain that it can find and it keeps like crawling down. I, I definitely ran this before and it's, um, I reckon I've, uh, is, it, is it risky to like bump my memory up while I'm doing a demo? Let's find out. Yeah, that's weird. That popped up. Whoa. Okay, let's do it. Let's uh, let's give it more man. Let's give it more RAM. Probably make it all unstable and all sorts of stuff. But that's cool. Oh come on, really? Oh, no. There's like sixteen gig in this thing. Well, that was embarrassing. That didn't work. <laughs> Maybe we can come back to that rather than having everyone just sit here and watch me do this. Okay. So um, that was actually it. So it always dies in the last one. Um, <laughs> do we want to uh, talk about the exam or the subject? And um, if I can get this thing to work. Yeah, that's a good idea, actually. I'll, I'll, I've got a few slides I want to chuck in about, you know, the exam and what happens next. Um, yeah. so, may so maybe I'll pinch the screen and you can muck you, around. You do that and I'm going to reboot. Yeah, sweet. All right, uh, one second, I will share my screen. Yes, and I'll try not to uh, upset you all with <laughs> script as well as slides. Talk me through it, folks, what, about, what am I showing? Um, okay, let's just do a slideshow. We're looking good, George. Is that just the slideshow? That is just the slideshow. Wonderful. All righty. So thanks for the course. This has all been amazing, by the way, George. And, I'm, and it's not finished, but just assume that it is at the finish now. <laughs> thanks for the course. What do I do now? Uh, it's all very well giving you a free short course, but how are you going to apply it? Um, we hope you've enjoyed it. I certainly, what I have understood, have enjoyed and have certainly enjoyed George's delivery style. Um, I guess the first step, is finish the course exam and earn yourself a course certificate. Uh, generally 40 questions, generally multiple choice. Sometimes we play around with the format, but we'll just see how we go. Um, it's still to be formalized and we'll release it pretty much as soon as we've we figured out how we want to do it, but it'll be in the next few days. The important bits are that you only get one hour to do it. It's open book. You can look at all of the resources and all of the resources will be available in perpetuity. Uh, there's no due date. Um, it's just there's a, a hurdle requirement. You need to have done all of the uh, module quizzes that we've done sort of every week after these webinars. We've released the five question quizzes. You need to, to get three out of five on those and then you can sort of unlock the exam. Make sure you revise before you do it because you only get one attempt. Um, the, the downside of having it open uh, for all time is that we can't lock it off later and then sort of um, just leave it forgotten. So we, we keep it all locked down and we don't share the results. So um, unless you really want to sort of ask on a specific question, um, we won't be able to share which ones you got right and wrong. We'll just be able to share the mark at the end, but it's a 50% pass mark. And for those of you who are listening along diligently sort of while the course is going live, we award bonus marks. Uh, for people who engage in the um, in the forums in every model module, so um, so it's always a good idea. Yeah, forty questions, one hour. Make sure you're ready to go. Um, and if you have any technical issues, um, you can contact us with the details on the course site. So once you've done that, um, we will probably look at the questions, make sure they're behaving as we anticipated that they would, and um, send out a couple of reminder emails sort of every week. Don't don't wait too long because our experience is everyone just sort of tends to forget the content that was covered and need to go back and study more than they needed to anyway. Um, so try and chip away to the next couple of weeks and, and give it a go. Um, and then after a few weeks, we'll, we'll lock down the, the forums uh, and you know, you won't be able to get any bonus marks then and stop monitoring things so much. Um, so yeah, uh, chip away at it. Um, if you have any questions before you want to um, have a crack, feel free to send them in. 
Um, but then once you do get it, um, uh, get it finished, um, we'll release the marks um, as soon as we can. Um, and then you'll be able to download your, your certi certificates. They're not really, um, some often we get questions, you know, like, uh, can I, uh, can I use this in a, is it an official certificate? And it's only official in the sense that it's a short course completion certificate. It'll help in, you know, padding out a resume um, and, uh, you know, but to the greatest extent that I think education is its own award. Um, I think these short courses um, are, are sort of those. Um, after you do the exam uh, and, and finish off with all the, the resources, please fill out the, the course satisfaction survey. Um, I love reading what, what ideas people have uh, and they, they sort of help us frame, um, I guess what we do in future short courses, we, we're sort of coming to the point where we're, where we're going to be planning the 2021 ones. Uh, and recently we sort of, realize that actually it's it's people that are more advanced and we might need to start getting a bit more um, complex short courses like this one that George is delivering. I guess the, the benchmark is if I can understand it, it's too easy. Um, so this one um, has, has, has gone really well because I've you know, frequently been very lost. So on you, George. Just a quick question, George. How's your, um, um, how's your, your, your um, process going? It appears to be working now, but it's still populating. So I'll wait till it. Uh... Awesome. Yeah, Thanks. It's, uh, it's still really slow, but yeah, yeah it's, it's getting there. All righty. So I guess what I would encourage really strongly is to, to just keep going with your study. Um, uh, you know, if you've enjoyed this, there's heaps of ways to, to get involved. Um, of course, I love the short courses. Um, and for those people who have enjoyed this short course particularly. A few years ago, we ran Cyber Warfare and Terrorism, which is sort of, uh, I guess, the a really, I guess, important element in George's postgrad subject that he teaches, um, run by the, the first um, lecturer that we got to run the subject before George was about. Um, and it's almost more of a, a sociological perspective on things as opposed to the really tech stuff in the short course. Really interesting, um, very different, but I think it had, uh, complement this short course really well. Uh, if, if it's been a bit above your head, uh, it might be a good idea to go and have a, uh, take a backward step and, and look at the CompTIA Security Plus sh um, certification short course, where we basically go through uh, diff different, you know, uh, elements of that certification, which is a, a really useful, I think, and vendor neutral um, certification that sort of gets people up to speed and, and is often the first certification people earn. Uh, if you want to build some skills, I, I, I sort of, it's a false dichotomy, but I sort of broadly separate what we do into sort of skills and management side of cybersecurity. If you want to muck around and do some, some good labs and, and, and see some more demonstrations and those sorts of things, I recommend the pen testing short course. And then if you, if you want to look at sort of how to apply this in your context, I was chatting with, uh, I think it was Jeff through the week, who's, who's hopefully listening along now. Um, you know, if you want to sort of apply this to your setting and, and have more of like a high level strategic look at security and then in, um, get others to implement your strategy, maybe the SISM short course would be really good for you. It's just one of the many frameworks available um, for people who are, are looking at how to, I guess, manage the risk. And then of course the the stuff that pays for these short courses there's the, the you know hopefully a few of you are interested in some formal paid study i'd be suggesting that the cyber security and business administration streams would be of most relevance um uh, this short course would be most relevant to them um really interestingly uh, both at grad cert and masters um level um interestingly if you if you're sort of looking at you know, continue, uh, developing some tech skills, but looking at a long-term, I guess, uh, upper management uh, instead of, you know, keeping your hands on the tools and sort of specializing, maybe the, the business administrations um, courses would be really good because you can get cybersecurity specializations where you can maybe target specific skills and then um, um, do some more business subjects and, and sort of be able to be a bit of a conduit between tech teams and executive management. It's one to consider and one to, I guess, figure out in sort in um, with the assistance of, of, of us, hopefully have a chat and we'll sort of figure out what's best for you and when. 
here are some of the subjects. Um, as I said in, I think week one, you know, it's a, we like to think that we find, have found a good mix of um, the application of theory in, a, in an enterprise setting um, and sort of whichever area of security you're most interested in, we can sort of tailor subjects that, um, we can chuck subjects in your study plan that are most relevant for you. So, um, you know, if you, if you are wondering whether it's for you, the, the, you know, it is, it's just, we have to get creative and, and see what sort of solutions we can come up with um, if, if security is your thing. And then this is the one that I hope you can talk to a bit, George, more George. Uh, <laughs> this is the abstract and um, some of the topics that, that George discusses in his subject, ITE 5 v 4 Cyber Warfare and Terrorism. Um, I don't know if you want to have a quick chat or, or we'll get to the, uh, your presentation. How are you going, George? Yeah, good. I'm just walking around over here. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, so in, in terms of this subject, um, uh, I, I guess what we've covered off in the last sort of, you know, three to four weeks is really around, um, you know, some of the kind of, kind of that first part there, cyber attacks and defenses. I mean, that's kind of what we, what we covered. Um, whereas, and we probably touched a little bit on some of the other bits and pieces and maybe the future of, of warfare. Um, but yeah, the, the full subject obviously goes into a lot more, um, a lot more detail and it's, and it's a lot broader. Um, so yeah, I mean, I enjoy teaching it. Um, <laughs> but, um, and I'd love it all come along. It'd be great. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so. Yeah, and if you've already done this short course, George, um, I think people, you know, if you're keen on study, you know, you'd be mad not to jump in and, and sort of have a head start. Do the do the cyber security and warfare, uh, sorry, cyber warfare and terrorism short course as well, and, and you've got so many different resources that will augment your study in the subject. You'd really set yourself up for a, a good mark, I think, and good engagement. Um, so I just saw that thing that Alec popped up there. So there, there's no exams on um in the in the paid subject mm. Mm. yeah some people prefer the essays which and some people prefer the exams and you can mix and match as you go depending on your learning styles as well um uh i think this is pretty much my last slide um yeah i, I guess i think that certification is a really good idea and you'd be mad not to consider both if anyone says only do X or only do Y, I'd say, you know, stop, stop focusing on one thing. And <laughs> you probably got a bit of an agenda, but you know, like if you ever want to talk about which certification is right for you and how it could affect your ability to study in the future, um, do please get in touch. Um, you know, we, we might not be very technical ourselves, the, the support staff, but we do understand how it can affect your education. Um, and how it will affect, you know, I guess your employability and which skills you want to build and when and why. Um, a final point um, is this ADF cyber gap program that we've been talking about a little bit. If you're keen on studying, um, have a go. <laughs> do you know about this, George? Uh, yeah, I do. Um, because you mentioned it last week and I went yeah. right up about it. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 so. it's, it's just like, a, I think it's a no brainer. If, if you're going to be studying or if you're keen on studying and it's, you just need something to tip you over the edge, um, you go through the process of viral reports. It's, it's a relatively extensive process, but you know, all, all costs are covered and just a really valuable opportunity. I think um, you don't necessarily have to be obligated to, to the defense force, but, um, but you help. can. Yeah, it's, it's some for a lot of people, uh, it seems to be a dream job. So, you know, work yourself up to the ASD. Um, yeah, go nuts. Good luck with it. Um, and we can help you out if you want to sort of um, have a chat about how to apply and, and how other people that we've had successful in the program went about applying. And um, yeah, we can be a valuable resource if you need it. And then finally, just a lot of people I talk to say, oh, I've been working for 20 years and I never went to uni because I never needed to. And geez, I didn't even know I was able to get into uni. You absolutely can. If you've got experience or even just passion, that's enough for us to recommend you for a grad cert at least. Um, and from there you can, you know, that's just the first four 
subjects of your masters. Um, at, yeah. Can I say that I did that? Oh, did you? Yeah. So um, I, I did exactly that. So I joined, I came in with the grad cert um, back in 2008. Um, so yeah, so I, I did exactly that. I was, I'd been working professionally for probably about eight years. Um, <laughs> and um, I started in, you know, in a techie job and, I ended up doing the grad cert and masters and then obviously the, the doctorate. So, um, wow. Why'd you do it? What's that? Why, what, what made you take the jump? Had you been considering it for a while before you did it? Uh, the, which one? Jumping in for the grad cert. Oh yeah. Um, well I'd actually wanted to do the masters. Um, I, I think I, it was probably a, a, a sort of, uh, kind of short course like this. Maybe I, I can't remember. It was so long ago, but, um, I wanted to do the master's and I hadn't done the, the bachelor's degree. Um, and so, yeah, I, I applied and got the, yeah, you can jump in and do the, the grad cert, which is already two of the subjects that are in the master's, well, at least when I did it. Mm. Um, and so I got accepted to that and yeah, the rest is history, I guess. So it was a really good pathway um, to, to, you know, getting those, um, those um, qualifications. Yeah. Great. Um, mm. Yeah, it's incredibly common. So many people with so much experience just think for some reason or not for some reason, it's just probably an indictment on tertiary education institutions broadly, you know, like these um, sort of intimidating ivory towers to some degree. Um, it's, it, it's, it ain't necessarily so. We love figuring out how to get people into study if they want to study and, and you're sort of tailoring courses to people's objectives. So if if you can get in touch and we'd we'd love to help i'm done george i've got nothing is that enough yeah. stretch yeah all right well, let's I'll take the screen back then I'll, I'll do that. <laughs> uh i'll stop oh. sharing um yeah thanks thanks heaps uh, everyone for putting up with more of my sales garbage screen one okay Quick. all right you see that yeah gotcha Cool, works now. So obviously, I, I guess what I was getting at, and I'm pretty much done too, um, is this, I, I just did the, um, the footprinting. And the reason why this is useful is, so I put the domain in um, and it has returned a few things uh, that I could see there. So it's returned my DNS servers. Okay, yeah, cool. Um, obviously, I try and minimize my footprint, so there's not a lot to see, but what has come up to, which is sort of of interest, which yes, I get it, you could do an NS lookup and get the same information, but is my um, like uh, MX records. So just by looking at that, and like I said, it's no big secret because you could just do an MX record and if you try and fish me, good luck. Um, you, you can see here that I'm using Office 365 um, which means that you know if, you, if someone wanted to target me with an Office 365 style um, attack, um, you know, it's, I, 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 it would be um, appropriate um, to, to do so. Um, there, uh, I, I was playing with this, which is the person identifying thing, because um, I, I have used this before to kind of, you know, um, look for, um, you know, specific information around um, for like investigations and things like that. Um, but I think I need the paid license to use this properly. Anyway, in terms of just footprinting infrastructure, um, really straightforward, works with the free version. Um, a, a, as I said, the only challenge is things like email, don't like like the, uh, what was it, the company stalker machine, doesn't work with the free version. But there are other tools like the Harvester, which uh, is actually in Kali, I think. Um, it is. So, you know, tools like this can actually scrape you know, email addresses, so you, you know, you can see what your sort of exposure is for, for you know, your organization's domain. Um, so yeah, lots of tools that you can use to gather, um, you know, Intel and recon and, and try and work out where your, where your holes are and, um, you know, manage that risk. So that was it. So sorry about the, the, the reboot there, um, but um, we got there. Uh, no, good timing, really. Let me <laughs> get my spiel in. That's, that's really interesting. Well, we have about 760,000 questions. Uh, <laughs> so um, I guess, first of all, I'd just like to thank you so much, George. This has been such an interesting short course. Um, 
so different, I think, from many of the other ones we do. Really, really useful demonstrations. I hope all of you have got a load out of it um, listening along. Um, I guess now we'll just sort of, um, yeah, thank everyone who wants to, um, to get going where we've already, we're already over time, but we'll stick around if that's all right with you, George, for a little while and maybe answer any questions that, um, are in the question and answer. Matt, I'd, I'd welcome you come along. Um, I'll open up the Q and a now and, and just look for some questions of my own to ask you to. Um, but if either of you have any that you want to, um, to get into, um, feel free, but I guess we'll start, um, start somewhere near the top. Oh, and um, yeah, maybe I'll start with Ignacio's question. He's asked it a few times, and I'm sorry, Ignacio, for the wait. Uh, what is George's view of the zero trust approach to providing access-based dynamic security? I think we touched on this last week, but um, couldn't have done yeah, it. Yeah, um, what's my view? Look, I, I think that um, I'm in favor of the zero trust model, but I think there's a lot of challenges around it. And how realistic, um, you know, an organization can get to that model is, I guess, yet to be seen. I think one of the, there's, there's a couple challenges that I can think of off the top of my head. You know, one of those is going to be things around um, culture and, you know, basically having this different model where, you know, everyone is kind of almost not trusted, well, everyone's not trusted. Um, but the other thing is around legacy applications and a lot of organizations run like legacy apps, which might not be, um, very uh, compatible with that type of model. So um, I think there's definitely merit in it, but I think it's a long way before we move to a full zero trust model, if that answers the question. Beauty, thank you. A uh, few questions I can quickly chuck out, or not chuck out, sorry, get to. Um, Hannah, can you please cut questions off from now though? Um, we've, we've got close to 40 and <laughs> I fear we'll be here all night as usual. Um, yeah, thank, thanks also, George, for your generosity for the last few weeks in, in going over time. Um, Christopher, will, fun. Oh, I'm glad to hear it. I, I, I hope so. Um, Christopher asks uh, whether we'll be doing a short course for the new Sec Plus or Security Plus 601. It's for an older version. It's about three or four years old now, but um, still really useful. But it's a really good idea. Um, we, we sent out a, an email, I think, a few days ago asking which certifications people are interested in, which short courses people would like to see. So I guess we'll, um, we'll go where the people want us to, to some degree. Um, um, so yeah, let us know. But in any case, if, if it's a new version of a certificate, um, usually the, the old course will, will still be really useful. We've got, you know, old Cisco ones, CISP, uh, CISM, they're all over the place. Um, and, and the changes, you know, whilst not insignificant, um, won't be complete. Uh, Heining Luo asks, do we have mocks before the exam? Unfortunately, no, sorry, Heining. Um, probably um, never really needed to. The, the exams aren't really um, designed to be incredibly difficult. It's more just to cement the knowledge that you hopefully would have gained or consolidate that which you already had. Um, so, so don't stress too much. Um, and if, if you, um, you know, come close to passing you know, we can probably organize a reset. Um, don't worry too much about it. Just make sure you get it done before, you know, you forget everything. Uh, Sam asks, I have many years in security, risk and compliance and a CISM and CISA certification. Do I get credit for these? Um, yes, CISM and CISA are both credits in the Master of Cybersecurity stream. Uh, and one of them, CISM, is for the business administration. And sometimes we can award credit for experience um, and we base that on basically a third party uh, assessment from the Australian Computer Society and they say yes you're a certified uh, what do they call it technologist or certified professional um, and we can say yep if you get one of those sort of designations we can award some credit but um, it's hard to quantify otherwise. Uh, Raya asks when can we start the final exam for this short course? Um, we'll just we're just finally, we're just finalizing a couple of the questions. Um, we're, we're trying to get a bit interesting with them. Um, and sometimes we, we have a, our ambition outweighs our ability to <laughs> deliver the things that we'd like to do. So, um, so we'll try, we'll keep playing with it. And if we uh, run out of time, we'll just, we'll just launch it as is. And now I've lost my place. Uh, I don't even know where you're reading these from. 
Yeah, probably. I'm I'm towards the bottom. Oh. Uh, can you recommend good reading material? Oh, that's a that's a good well. one. Uh, I'll leave that one to George and Matt. <laughs> uh, it depends what you what, what you're looking for. Yeah, really. it's very broad. Um, I mean, like in terms of, you know, there's. Um, I mean, if you're looking at, I mean, specifically reading or, you know, are we talking just about general, I guess that's what I'm, I'm trying to work out. So for example, um, you know, the, um, you know, the IC, um, uh, sorry, the SANS internet storm center is a good, like uh, sort of podcast that I was listening to, but that's not reading material. Um, uh, I guess, yeah. What, what is, what specifically are you, are you looking for? Because, you know, that could, that's a very broad question, I guess. Um, it really depends on what, what you're after. Yeah. Just the only advice I could give would be read widely and, <laughs> and always read with a, a critical, uh, lens, I suppose. Yeah. Like if someone said, Hey, what book do you want to, uh, do you recommend if I'm studying for CISSP, I could totally help you with that. Um, you know, <laughs> and I would consider that good reading material. Um, uh, yeah. J Jet is after textbooks. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It depends what you what you're looking for the textbooks for. Yeah. So I guess, like I said, as an example, and I had this discussion with someone um, that's I think it might be even on tonight. Um, you know, like when I did the CISSP a few years ago, you know, the specific books that I found really useful. Um, you know, the Cybex book I found really really good. I found it interesting. It wasn't too long. It came with quizzes. I thought that was really great. Um, you know, same thing with, you know, the, the, the SISM book, when I, when I went through that guide, I found, and, and I'm, I'm winding the clock back to, you know, sort of about six years ago, it was, it was horrid. Um, but I believe the new version is much better. Um, so, you know, uh, it's, it's really up to you, but I've had pretty good success with, um, you know, in terms of textbooks with the, the sort of Cybex and the Wiley books, I found those to be the easiest for me personally to digest and they're not too um, heavy is probably a good way to put it. Um. <laughs> uh, ah, Rohit asks, would this short course or other applicable short courses, uh, would these courses be applicable to either an MBA or Master of Entrepreneurship and Innovation? MBA computing, yes. Um, standard MBA, no. Basically, short courses are good for credit for any CSU and IT masters postgrad course, uh, not just the CSU ones. They, they uh, can't award credit for short courses. We do. Uh, oh, geez, the old, uh, I work as a cybersecurity manager. Do I go for CISP or CISM, George, Matt, any preferences? Cause I, I always, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> They're very different. Um, when I did the uh, CISM, it was the old school color in the circles. Um, on the Scantron. So that was pretty horrible. Um, the, the SISM exam is, in my opinion, at least it was, it's probably changed since I did it, but I think it's still fairly accurate, is it's a lot more managerial based. Um, it's less technical. Like for example, in CISSP, you're, you're going to need to know the, um, you know, the, the, all the layers of the OSI model. You're gonna to need to know that. Whereas I don't think that came up in the um, in the SISM exam once it was more around situational things and how you would do that. So if you're in a cybersecurity manager role where you're probably more decision making, doing more than anything, um, then I would probably be geared towards the SISM. If it's going to be a little bit more technical and you need to have that sort of technical knowledge, and um, then the SISP is probably going to be a little bit more valuable. And then of course there is concentrations within SISP like SISP ISSMP which is the, um, the management version of that. And I believe there's only 18 of those in Australia. Um, I am not one of them, but I have the book. Um, I just haven't got it yet. <laughs> yeah, basically so, one then. <laughs> so. um, just to, sorry. No, go for it, Matt. I was just going to say, just to quickly echo what George was saying, I, I, haven't, I haven't taken either the CISP or CISM certifications, but a number of my colleagues have taken CISP. Um, and the general feedback has been just that the learning experience around um, getting ready for the certification going through that, uh, as, as far as it's been fed back to me, has been really good among, uh, around enabling them with the, the hands-on practical um, side of it as well. W would, you, would you say that's been your experience as well, George? Yeah, as I said, it's very, um, you, and I think I used the term in the very first 
week where I said, you know, if anyone that's done it, you'll be familiar with the term mile wide, inch deep. Um, it requires a lot of knowledge and a lot of it is technical. As I said, you need to know the OSI model. Um, you, you need to know how encryption works um, and, you know, key, key, man key exchanges and, and, and you need to know that. But you also need to have a good level of understanding on things like business continuity and disaster recovery. Um, so, you know, that's the, that's the CISP, but, um, but yeah, whereas the CISM, as I said, is far, in my opinion, well, as at least it was when I did it you know, over half a decade ago, it was um, far less technical, um, but it was, it was very, very decision-based, which actually, um, and if anyone that has done it, you might recall that when ISACA write exams, they tend to do this thing where um, more than one answer could be correct. Mm. Um, but it, there's one that's more correct. Oh, I'm not, I'm not going to do that to anybody. Don't worry in the, um, <laughs> but you know, there, there was a lot of that and it was kind of like, Oh man, all three of those are like, you know, three out of four of those could be right. Oh, which one is it? And it's the, the best one. I oh, chuck so, a couple in, chuck a couple in. That'd be yeah. fun. We can do that. Yeah. So that was one of the challenges with it. But, um, like I said, I ended up with both. Um, I, I did the system first. Um, and then I, I did CISP shortly thereafter. Um, but yeah, they both have their own sort of merits depending on, you know, what requirements that you need. Yeah. Often just often surely it would just depend on, uh, whether you're getting sponsorship and what your sponsor wants. Um, you, you know, if it's your, if it's your, your workplace is doing it, they'll have a preference, no doubt. Um, yeah. Yeah. If you're in a position to be sponsored anyway. Uh, Shannon asks, any thoughts on hack back in future, in particular, the ethics of this approach beyond tightly controlled actions of governments, say individual victims or corporations? Discuss with reference to the text. <laughs> any thoughts on hack back? Um, hmm. Any thoughts on the legality of hack back? I mean, aside from the ethic, ethical issue, issues of having poor attribution, not really being sure about how you're hacking um, or who you're hacking, what would be the legal ramifications of that? Well, chances are it's probably illegal. Um, that's probably where I'm going with that based on first statement. Uh, I'm actually trying to find, because I, I did write a paper on this um, a while ago, um, which basically covered that, you know, in terms of the, the sort of, you know, issues around you know, attribution and, and, and those sorts of um, things. And, and as an example, that often threat actors will hijack, you know, will, will hack into someone else's infrastructure to conduct an attack. And an example that I said just earlier on was like the use of IoT devices, right? Um, you know, if someone hijacks someone's refrigerator, what do you do? Attack a refrigerator um, and want spoil all their food? I mean, I'd be devastated. Um, so, you know, uh, and, and, and I think that, you know, when it comes to governments, if there's a clear... Um, you know, clear attribution, and it is without a doubt that that is that that they're that they're attacking the target. Um, then, you know, that is probably something that may happen. Um, and certainly, I think it does in some scenarios. When you're talking about true like cyber warfare, um, I think for the general, you know, and, and I think in those state sponsored settings, that sort of thing does happen. Um, but yeah, in the sort of private space yeah not so much um i lost the question now it disappeared but... sorry got rid of it no oh, okay <laughs> trigger happy uh conscious that we've got um 15 questions and uh over time but that's all right uh the tools asks junady that have been used in this demo and previous demos okay to use for education purposes on any public network or should they be used or should they be only used on your home or test network? Is it tools that have been used in the demo and previous demos that can use for education purposes on any public network? Um, so what, do, do I say you consult your legal professional or? Um, <laughs> Is that you? No, <laughs> it's not me. Uh, and I, and I, I think I'm not going to do a Juris Doctor. Um, so, Anyway, so are they okay to use on a public network? 
if you're if you're talking about uh, like using a a tool like a like a vulnerability scan well a vulner vulnerability scan and once again this is not legal advice i'm not your lawyer um <laughs> you have to find this out yourself but generally speaking a port scan is something that happens all the time right um our organization gets port scanned all the time and it's recon and so at that point there's nothing really um not a lawyer but there's nothing really illegal going on and that's over a public network so you know running an mapp yeah okay open vast where you're looking for vulnerabilities is starting to get a little bit cloudy and i would probably recommend against doing that and then if you go a step further and you pull up metasploit and you do that against a public machine um that is definitely a no-no so you know and likewise something like a multego and you're just like doing recon once again you know, you're doing this against public sources, but you're not actually, um, it's nothing malicious at that point. It's, it's when you kind of cross that line, I think is where it starts to become an issue. Um, so in short, the answer is depends. Um, I think one of the things is to kind of exercise common sense. Um, you know, don't try and take down a server. Don't try and break into it. Um, you know, if you just want to, have a look like, you know, running showdown and just seeing, you know, how many webcams there are in the world. Um, yeah, cool. Um, but don't click on them and go, you know, spying on people because that will definitely be a no, no. So there's no straight answer for that, but yeah, I, I think that's probably the best way I can answer that is just be aware of what the, uh, what the laws are and, you know, think about if someone did that to you, <laughs> how do you like it? <laughs> That's a good starting point. Uh, maybe just a few more questions. Um, this one I'll, I'll actually chuck out to the chat. This is from Ravi. Um, what is the best place on the web that provides updates on the recent attacks and how they've been overcome? Is there is there sort of, uh, I don't know, a, a blog of, you know, recent attacks? If either of you have anything you can chuck out, otherwise we'll, we'll leave it. Um, um. Qual qualities from Kurt. Yeah, I mean, like once again, some of those sites like Dark Reading or um, uh, you know, like some of the like the Cisco Talos stuff, um, FireEye, they they do tend to put up some things, but it's not going to be you know every attack. Um, so you know, there's just some public sort of sources. Obviously, news sites will put stuff up too now and then. Yeah, I see someone's just popped up the Verizon DBIR report. Um, I guess the, the DBR report is good, but it's, um, and, and I do use it and it's good to kind of get a, a sort of lay of the land, um, but it's based on a specific set of companies that um, contribute to it. Um, there's actually a Telstra one too. So there's, there's a Telstra report that, um, Telstra State of Cybersecurity, is that what's called? Something like that. Um, also free to download and it covers more Australia and a bit of sort of Asia. And it um, is similar to the Verizon report, um, except obviously it's a little bit more regionalized to us. So that's, um, yeah, that, that I think is it there. Um, cool, thank you. Just gonna, just gonna throw this out there on top of it. Not nearly as useful from a, an informational perspective, but there's a couple of really interesting, at least from a, a dashboard porn perspective, um, live threat maps uh, produced by Checkpoint, uh, Norse, uh, several others. I think Kaspersky has one as well. Um, I'll post the, uh, the one for Checkpoint into chat just because it's interesting um, seeing what they're showing as being, or at least claiming to be uh, live threat feeds as their uh, various <laughs> guest data centers have been detecting them. Again, I'm not going to vouch for their authenticity, but it's interesting to see what's happening in the real time uh, around the world as well. Thanks, Ace, for that, Matt. Uh, also, also Hannah's just uh, confirmed in the chat that the exam has an actual due date, or not due date, sorry, a, a launch date, um, Monday, five o'clock. So thanks, Hannah. Um, and yes, we'll, we'll let you all know. We'll send an email and, and send links and all those sorts of things. Uh, maybe maybe two questions. I'll, I'll sort of combine a few uh, and say, future of IT, George. Uh, <laughs> what future is, of IT, George. What, what is quantum computing? How does it relate to the future of cybersecurity? Does it help in defending against threats? Um, and we, I guess we'll ask a machine learning question at the same time. You know, are they secure? Do we have any idea yet? 
Um, well, they're, they're different, right? So yeah. quantum, and I'm, I'll be honest, I am no expert on quantum computing. Um, it's something that I've kind of dabbled with and I found very interesting. Um, it is very different from traditional computing in that it uses um, like physics opposed to electronics. So if you know, if you think about um, electronics and you've got that whole, you know, kind of one zero type thing, you know, it's either on or off. Um, quantum computing uses physics and I, it's a light. Um, maybe someone can chip in there and, um, uh, and obviously the computational power of that is far greater um, than um, than you know traditional computing, and um, I can't remember what how you define what a qubit is, um, but that's the sort of um, you know the sort of lingo that's used in, in in the quantum computing realm. And because of that, you know, um, higher computational capacity, um, you know, some of the, the the concerns are that when you think about encryption. And when you think about breaking encryption is the way to do that is to like, if you do it a brute force, for example, um, to, to crack the, the, the key is to run these computational cycles. Um, and if you can do that at a rapid rate, you're going to get to that end a lot quicker. So um, mm. that's why, you know, that's kind of next, um, I guess the, the, the new thing. Um, yeah. That, that chart you showed us, I think it was last week of, of how long it takes to, to do things with a certain length password, I suppose that would be a nice visual representation with a quantum computer. Eight yeah, seconds. That, that would shrink. Yes, <laughs> that, that would shrink. Yeah. Yeah, well, probably a short course in that one, Rebecca and Hannah. Uh, quantum computing, discuss. Um, I guess final question for now. Uh, Shannon, uh, do you see that nation state offensive cyber operations for economic advantage will accelerate compared with attacks for more traditional militaristic national security reasons. This is the sort of stuff you discuss at <laughs> the subject, isn't it? Well, yeah, it is. And we are seeing that already um, with, and I, I'm, I'm not going to name names, but um, you know, we're, we're seeing some nation state um, th uh, actors um, that are doing offensive operations for the, for the, you know, for the purpose of economic advantage. Um, I mean, oh, I'm prepared to call it out. George, it's, it's New Zealand, everyone. It's definitely New Zealand. <laughs> definitely. So, um, yeah, so, you know, uh, and, and I think that will, I think that will accelerate. I mean, it's kind of really accelerating pretty, pretty quickly. Um, and to be honest, I think that's probably going to be more prevalent than um, military um, offensive attacks. Yeah, I guess if you want the full answer, Shannon, you'll have to sign up to the subject. Um, that's all the questions. Uh, heavens above, you've been very generous and clever and thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Matt, for, for joining in. That was, that was great. Nice to see you again. Feel free to join any old time. Um, thanks. <laughs> thanks, IT Masters, Rebecca, Hannah, um, for making these possible. I, I do love these short courses. Um, thank you, everyone, for hanging around. It's nine o'clock and there's still 260 people, George, so they're everyone's you know having a lot of time um hey, Matt, just pop his email address up there watch him get like all these phishing attacks now <laughs> oh, that was meant to go to someone specifically but hey <laughs> <laughs> and most of all uh george thank you that was a lot of fun um yeah, it's always really nice working well. with a new mentor no i appreciate that um that was great and yeah thanks everybody again for um coming along i hope you found that interesting and useful and um yeah look you can find me on LinkedIn is probably on the last slide of a few of the slides. Um, so yeah, just uh, reach out and say hi. Or Twitter, although LinkedIn's probably better. <laughs> anyway, have a good night, everyone. <laughs>